Chairman. <coughs> I do have an amendment. Okay. Uh, I'd like to offer the A1 amendment. Okay, members, we have the A1 amendment in the folder. Uh, this is uh, an author's amendment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Dreheim. Thank you. And, and the amendment deals with uh, Section 2. Um, if, if anybody cares to look at Section 2, um, we deleted the whole section on page 2 under Section 2. All right, Senator Dreheim, okay. let's, uh, let's hear about the bill. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so if you guys remember from last year, um, we, we had a, a, a bill, and, and this bill um, just simplifies statute and makes it a little more effective and targets those who are in need. Um, you know, it's a wonderful program. Uh, the, the bill originally was passed about 20 years ago and supports qualified job training programs through performance-based funding. So not only does it do real good work for people that really need a help, um, that don't have a lot of people looking out for them, but it's also performance-based, and, and, and I think that's wonderful. And, and I hope we have more programs uh, like that um, and is as successful as this program's been. Um, you know, the, the payoff for every dollar we spend, uh, the state receives $7 back, um, which, which has been fantastic, a real good investment. Um, so at that, I'll, I'll uh, let it go. Thank you. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's my pleasure to testify today my name is Leslie Dwight. I serve as the Director of Research and Organizational Development at Twin Cities Rise. Tom Streitz, the President and CEO, uh, regrets that he was unable to be here today, but appreciates that um, the hearing is happening. Twin Cities Rise is a local nonprofit that transforms lives out of poverty through personal empowerment, career training, <clears throat> and meaningful employment. We serve Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the metro area. 20 years ago, Twin Cities Rise partnered with the Minnesota Legislature to create this innovative pay for performance statute that, <clears throat> that pays only for long-term transformative results. Since 1998, we've placed thousands of low-income adults with the most barriers into full-time meaningful jobs um, that in 2017 paid about $14 per hour on average or 29,000 per year um, that's up from less than 7,000 in, in earnings on average at program start. <clears throat> Our long-term job retention is what makes us unique. It's high at 80% after one year and almost 70% after two years. Um, Annie Casey Foundation funded a, a project looking at benchmarks nationally and found that job retention after one year for similar organizations serving similar um, People in the program had about a 40% one-year job retention rate. The need, of course, continues to be high. Uh, we know that in this time of low unemployment that employers are desperate for workers, and the people that we serve are desperate for jobs, and they need the support and resources from Twin Cities Rise to get there. <clears throat> Twin Cities Rise um, supports the changes presented today to simplify the, the innovative pay for performance statute, making it more effective and targeting those who need it most. The most critical change um, uses the federal poverty guidelines to determine eligibility for the pay for the performance payments under the statute. So federal poverty guidelines are based on income and family size. Um, this updates the statute to be consistent with how other programs that serve low-income adults determine eligibility. It also focuses the statute on those who need it the most, um, <clears throat> which is consistent with the original intent 20 years ago. For a single individual in 2017, um, under the new guidelines, this would be $12,000 or less. 
for a family of four under the new guidelines, it would be about $24,000 or less. The change basically allows single parents who may not have been eligible before <coughs> to be eligible based on these family size guidelines. And then the other reason for the change is that the federal poverty guidelines are updated annually. The other changes include removing the requirement for the length of time in the training program and simplifying the reporting to be consistent with current practice and deed requirements. Um, in terms of the length of time, what we found is that employers um, want people sooner rather than later and that the folks that we serve also want to get jobs sooner rather than later. And so um, we've responded and we are working on shortening our program. And in terms of the reporting requirements, um, you know, this was written 20 years ago before lots of the current practices were in place. Um, we comply with all of the requirements in Workforce One. And, um, and so although we're happy to report annually to the commissioner, we see it as redundant, basically. Um, and then in terms of the um, author's amendment that you have before you under the guidance of Senator Champion, we've removed the, la removed the language um, regarding the minimum wage. So thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm happy to stay for questions. Ms. Dwight, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Senator Dreheim, anything you'd like to add before we open it up for questions? No, I think it's the whole intent of this bill was to make the program better and uh, improve already a great program and, and hope that we can continue for the next 20 years. So thank you. Members? Any questions? Seeing none, uh, Senator Dreheim, would you like to move uh, Senate File 2629 as amended uh, to be recommended to pass and sent to the floor? I do. Thank you. All right. We have a motion on the floor. Uh, Senator Dreheim, uh, Senator Goggin, question? Okay. Uh, all those in favor, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, the Senate file 2629 as amended uh, passes and is moved to the floor. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. And uh, you have another bill on the agenda. So let's uh, move into Senate file 2064. Senator Dreheim. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, so once again, this bill, uh, we had some bills last year dealing with accessibility. And um, you know the problem regarding accessibility, it's just confusing. And we're trying to clarify it a little bit. Um, you know, I think between the ADA, um, the, the, I think most of us expect all state buildings to be accessible. And um, I, I know there's been a lot of talk about, last year we dealt with um, some lawsuits to private industry for accessibility. And, and who would have thought that as a state we are not accessible? So I think it's just common sense. Um, you know, I think the intent of this bill was for housekeeping and just outdated language, just some clarification. Um, so that, that's it on a, on a real quick, brief description. Thank you. Okay. And we have a testifier. A good afternoon. Welcome to our committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Margo Imdick Cross, and I'm the Accessibility Specialist at the Minnesota Council on Disability. For over 44 years, MCD has served as a technical resource for legislators, state agencies, and the public on issues of disability policy and accessibility. I'm here today to speak in support of 20, Senate File 2064 and to seek your support for this housekeeping measure. Our goal is to eliminate language in Statute 326B.106, Subdivision 9, that has caused confusion over the years and has been used as a rationale for noncompliance to other state and federal laws 
that do require physical modification of a building for the sole purpose of providing access to people with disabilities. Both the Minnesota Human Rights Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act require that if access for per people with disabilities cannot uh, be achieved otherwise, reasonable modification to the built environment must be completed for the sole purpose of providing access to people with disabilities. The building code is quite clear as to when access is required, and this, this amendment we are seeking will not change building code. What the amendment does do is eliminate redundant, poorly worded language in state statute that has caused confusion over the years and unfortunately delayed and in some instances may have denied access to our community. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, members, any questions to the testifier? No? Okay. And. Uh, Senator Draheim, would you like to add something? Well, I was just going to mention we did get a email. I don't know if they're here to testify. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Ms. Kelleher, would you? Uh, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify? The Department of Labor and Industries here. Either as well. for or against the bill. Department of Labor and Industries also here. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Any and all, uh, Senator Draheim, any and all are welcome to uh, testify. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon. Welcome to our committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, this was a, a late catch today, so I have not had the opportunity to talk to Senator Drehelm about this bill. Our concern initially comes under the subdivision 9, where the bu only buildings included would be state and school district buildings. And we were concerned that this could be an unfunded mandate uh, going forward. Uh, but as we got here, we talked to the disability com um, advocates, and they assured us it was a tech, mm -hmm. uh, housekeeping bill. Um, but we're going to work into, out and see if we can add some language that gives us assurance. Very good. And your name, just for the record, so we capture that. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, my name is Grace Kelleher, and I work for the Minnesota School Boards Association. Thank you, Ms. Kelleher. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify on Senate File 2064? Good afternoon. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Scott McClellan. I'm the director of the Construction Codes and Licensing Division with the Department of Labor and Industry. And I, the department, although we are neutral on the bill, I can say with uh, most definite assurance that the language that remains uh, does not impose any new requirement on existing building owners. Uh, the code uh, must provide for making buildings that are constructed or modified accessible to and usable by persons. We do have a code, the Minnesota Accessibility Code, that does just that. However, the code is not retroactive. It only when you undergo new construction, additions, or remodeling does it have an impact. So the department does not see any harm to our agency by uh, deleting this language. Very good. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, members, any questions? Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify on Senate File 2064? Senator Dreheim. Final words? Thanks for your time. All right. And Senator, uh, your intent is to lay this over? Is that correct? Uh, okay. Yep. So Senate file 2064 will be laid over. Thank you. Okay, members, next on the agenda, we have Senate file 1901. Uh, Senator Cohen is. Okay. Senator Cohen is on his way. Okay, members, while we wait for Senator Cohen, uh, our next committee meeting will be on Wednesday, uh, this coming Wednesday, March 14th, and we have a couple bills on the agenda. The first bill that will be on the agenda for Wednesday is Senate File 2915, is a Senator Eichhorn bill, and then Senator Paul Anderson will have Senate File 
2434. And again, that is at our next committee hearing on Wednesday, March 14th, same time, same place. And with that, we will just pause for a few minutes until Senator Cohn arrives uh, to testify on Senate file or to present Senate file 1901. Senator Cohen, we are ready for you. Senator Cohen, good afternoon. Welcome to the Senate Jobs Committee. Mr. Chairman and members, thank you. Um, wanted to present to you Senate File 1901. And uh, it's a bill that was introduced last year uh, toward the end of session and uh, felt it was a fairly simple bill. I think there have been a couple questions raised by it, but let me just explain um, uh, where I'm coming from, what the bill is, um, and I'll ask uh, Mr. Chair to provide testimony. I, I was approached by the St. Paul Saints, and I've been involved with the Saints uh, I won't say since the inception, but I've had some close ties to the Saints, some involvement. Uh, I authored the legislation relative to the bonding request, um, and so I was a natural person for them to uh, seek out. Uh, looking for an exemption on a seasonal basis, as the, as the bill indicates, a very simple bill, for minor league baseball players. <coughs> and I viewed it as very comparable to other kinds of issues uh, I've raised, for instance, in, in discussions in my office just a few minutes ago with uh, theaters around town, I'm a little bit closer to, uh, to theaters, I think, than I am to baseball teams. But um, um, you know, looking at uh, theaters where folks are employed on a part-time basis and are not members of uh, Actors' Equity, for instance. Uh, that's not true of the larger theaters, but it's certainly true of the smaller theaters in town. And so this seemed to be reasonable in terms of the Saints being a part-time employer uh, the season lasts for approximately three months. Uh, obviously, this is not uh, a team because it's part of an in, it's an independent baseball team. It's not covered by uh, the major league uh, contract, which would cover uh, minor league affiliates. This is uh, something separate from that. So, on that basis, was uh, uh, happy to author the bill. Rather than listen to me, let's listen to. Uh, Mr. Chair, who, who is the uh, VP for the, the Saints uh, for Finance and can offer the perspective from the minor league team. And, and should also mention that obviously this is unique in Minnesota. This is the only minor league baseball team. It's an independent team. It's not affiliated with a major league team and so is in a fairly unique situation. So if it might be possible to yeah. offer the testimony, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and, and Senator Cohn, before we do that, I believe we have an A3 amendment, an author's amendment. Yeah, Are you aware you, of that? Y uh, yes. So okay. I, was, I wasn't sure if you wanted to, uh, to put it in that shape if it's possible. Yep. Somebody so offer uh, the amendment. Senator Champion uh, moves the A3 amendment. Members, this is an author's amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to our committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Derek Scherer. I'm Executive Vice President and General Manager with the St. Paul Saints. Um, I appreciate Senator Cohen uh, offering the opportunity for me to speak here today. Um, minor League Baseball players never have been covered by minimum wage and overtime laws at the federal level or to the best of our knowledge, the laws of any state or other jurisdiction. Uh, and there are several reasons for this. Um, minor league baseball seasons, such as that of the St. Paul Saints, are seasonal in nature, and players are employed by the team only for several months of the year. Uh, current Minnesota law exempts those employed seasonally in comparable industries, uh, carnival, uh, circus, fair, or ski facility. Um, another reason minor league players are, are trainees uh, by nature, we have a, a unique uh, employee, non-traditional employee-employee relationship. Um, they are utilizing the Saints as a platform to develop their skills and experience and knowledge to become major league players, at which point they would make uh, significantly more in wages. Uh, while not specifically addressing the status of minor league baseball players, federal law currently exempts, tra exempts trainees in the entertainment and creative industries. 
Um, lastly, the, the, the economic existence of minor league teams uh, who represent the grassroots, uh, the grassroots of our, our great game would be seriously jeopardized uh, by uh, anything changing uh, within that status. So, Mr. Sherr, if we, if Sherr, is that correct? Yes, okay. that's correct. Mr. Thank Sherr, you. If, if we do not pass this legislation, or if this legislation is not signed into law, then what, what is the outcome or what are the consequences? Uh, nothing, in, nothing immediately, but, but we would be open to the potential of, of, of minimum wage and overtime laws significantly impacting uh, the way we operate and teams uh, within our league uh, in, in other states, I suppose. Um, but that, the, the, the key issue would be that, that we, uh, we also are a member of a league that has a league bylaws uh, that's, that state how we are able to pay our players. We're, we're in a league that has a salary cap. Um, so one very uh, immediate reaction would be as if, as if minimum wage and overtime law were to impact us, uh, then we may be in a position to not be able to abide by our league bylaws, which would force us not to be able to operate. Very good, thank you. I have Senator Isaacson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. First of all, I just wanted to be clear, and I think you answered this, somebody answered this. What's the current law with seasonal? Can I ask counsel or somebody that question? Like, how, are we, how is that working right now? Is there a general way I can get a quick explanation of that? Um, counsel? Mr. Chair, members, and Senator Isaacson. So there are uh, currently, you'll see in the bill that there are some exemptions for individuals that aren't uh, considered employees for purposes of minimum wage and overtime. And there are seasonal agricultural workers, some that are exempted. There are also, um, uh, I, I believe they, they talked about the, on line 2.16, individuals employed on a seasonal basis in a carnival, circus, fair, or ski facility. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are 19 exemptions right now, but the, the baseball players could be included, the minor league baseball players could be included in that seasonal I, I, the draft is just done that they have their own okay. clause. Senator Isaacson? Uh, I'm wondering, what do we, just for my own edification, what do we pay, do you guys pay the players? Mr. Scher? Uh, yes, Senator, thank you. It, it, it represent, it, there's a range of pay for the players, uh, and our, our league has a very uh, detailed um, salary cap and payroll rules, uh, which are based on the level of experience at which each player plays. Mm -hmm. So from veteran uh, to rookie, uh, the, sc the scale of pay ranges between $800 a month uh, to upwards of, of $10,000 a month, depending on um, time of year, type of player, um, how bad a team might want a specific player. Senator Isaacson. Uh, so. I, I apologize. Mr. Uh, the, sure. the only the, the 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 additional pay would be there would be per diem involved sure. there as well. I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause for now. Thank okay. you. Uh, Senator Drehan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two questions, if I may. Um, the first, define minor league. So, in, in close to my hometown, uh, Mankato Moon Dogs, are they considered sure. moon, are minor league? Uh, Mr. They would, Mr. Chair. Oh yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Senator. Uh, they would be considered minor league, but not professional minor okay. league. Uh, those players are collegiate players who are uh, playing for the first time using a wood bat and being given the opportunity to show what they can do in front of professional scouts. Uh, so, Senator Drehan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So under 3.6, it, you know, it, it just says minor league level. And, and I, I have, these players are given the contract, right, before they start, so they know what their pay is before they start, correct? Yes. Okay. So I, I think I have no problem with this 100%. I think it's a great opportunity for these kids to play. Um, but I, I, my only concern would be the definition of minor league baseball. Does it apply to what level would be my, my only concern? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To, to the testifiers, so uh, just to make this, this clear, uh, you are attempting to um, make sure that your 
trainees or players are exempt from any St. Paul minimum wage law. Is that what you're attempting to do? Mr. Chair. Senator, thank you. Uh, we are attempting to have our players included in the existing exemptions for um, seasonal, uh, seasonal employees. Senator Champion. J just to be clear, though, yeah. you said earlier that you wanted to make sure that they were not open to any of the minimum wage laws uh, that could be uh, that that could be passed or dealt with. So, just for clarity, does that mean if the city of St. Paul passed a minimum wage ordinance or bill, if this law pass, if this bill passes, exempting out or carving out the folks that you want carved out, would they or would they not be subject to that? St. Paul minimum wage ordinance. Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I guess I would defer to uh, Senator Cohen to some extent of that question. Uh, would their contract, and I'm answering your question with a question, would, the, would their contract make them exempt from that anyway because they've agreed to a certain pay scale? So our attempt isn't to, to combat um, or protect against specifically St. Paul minimum wage law. Um, we certainly have employees in the ballpark who would be impacted by that. Uh, concessions, ushers, uh, employees uh, that, that don't fit that, that trainee um, category. But uh, that, so that would be my only but question. Senator Cohn. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I would guess, and I'd like to direct it back to Mr. Chair, but sure. my, my guess is you're talking about a three month season. And oh. so if a player at the top end is making four to $5,000 a month, they're far beyond the minimum wage. Uh, the question might be if there are, in effect, trainees at the lower end, are they exempt from that minimum wage? And that gets into the question of, again, seasonal employment as opposed to uh, year-round employment. And, and Mr. Chairman, I would just suggest, um, because this is an amendment sought to 177.23, if you look at the exemptions, there's an element of whose ox is being gored, clearly, as to uh, what's, what's uh, contained. One possible uh, source of employment, if you look at, uh, I think, number part 13, where it, it talks about seasonal basis in a carnival, circus, fair, or ski facility. I can't speak for the carnival, the carnival, circus, or fair, but if you look at the ski facilities around town, and to be fair, I don't think there are any in Minneapolis or St. Paul, if you look at the ski facilities, such as Buck Hill, I can promise you that those people work um, uh, my buck kill days are past, but I can promise you that those people uh, work far more than 40 hours a week during the season. And uh, uh, I'm not sure how ski facility got in there originally, uh, but those are people who work on a seasonal basis, which is a longer season in terms of number of months than the St. Paul Saints, since I, the season will start roughly November 1st and will last as long as the snow lasts. Um, or as long as they can, uh, they can make powder, um, those folks are working significantly longer than, than 40 hours a week. Um, Senator Chair? Champion. Senator Cohen, I don't think you answered my question, so maybe I'm not helping out here, so uh, maybe I'll try it again. <coughs> Buck Hill, ski folks, are not in the city of St. Paul. The Saints are in the city of St. Paul. So my question is, if the city of St. Paul passes a minimum wage, and if the folks, whether they're on the low end, whatever the calculation would be, would this, if this bill passes, would they be subject to or exempt from St. Paul's minimum wage? Ordinance if it was to pass because this because the Saints are in the city of St. Paul So I just want to I'm not asking about the ski folks Got it. They're not in the city of St. Paul Would they be subject to the St. Paul's ordinance? Senator Cohen Mr. Chairman, Senator Champion um, I guess then to be fair I can't answer that because I don't know what the St. Paul City Council is considering 
relative to, to minimum wage are what kinds of ex exemptions they might be creating, because I think they're going a different direction than the city of Minneapolis did. I looked at this from the perspective of the baseball players. I'm assuming none of the players would be subject to St. Paul's minimum wage, uh, or would, would be paid at a level greater than the $15 an hour, would be my guess. I can't speak for other seasonal employees, such as um, people who sell concessions. I couldn't speak to the people who sell concessions at movie theaters in the city of St. Paul. Um, but in terms of, of the employees considered full-time employees for the purpose of the season, uh, my guess is that they're making more than $15 an hour. Senator Cohen. Senator, Senator Champion. We do have a long list of questions, okay. but you so I will leave continue. Feel free to continue on. No, no, I just wanted to make sure that I'm really clear. Senator Cohen, did, 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 did I hear you say that you're not sure what your city of St. Paul is considering as it pertains to minimum wage? You're, you're not engaged at all in those discussions, so you have no sense of what they're considering? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Mr. Champion, I, I don't know what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I've talked to uh, some members of the city council. I've not been involved on a day-to-day -day basis with them. Senator Cohen, I, Senator I don't Champion. think I used the word day to day. You said you have not been involved at all. And I just wanted to just make sure that I'm not leading you astray or you're not leading me astray because I would think that a man of your caliber and insightfulness would have some sense of what's going on in the city of St. Paul. So I would hope that you would have an answer for me that this bill would not exempt out the saints from that ordinance or would know what the impact or the potential impact would be? Well, Mr. Senator Mr. Cohen. Mr. Chairman, Senator Champion, I guess I could repeat myself. I, I do appreciate the comment about insightful. And what was the other adjective you used to describe me? Because I'm wondering if I'm, I could use that. I'm sure that you would come with, 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 with others, uh, great senator. Because I was flattered by that, Senator Champion. Um, but uh, uh, the, the serious answer was, yes, I've had involvement with the St. Paul City Council. I don't know what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of, of what kind of ordinance they might pass. It's my understanding that St. Paul Saints baseball players would be making more than what's being considered by the St. Paul City Council. I am not sure about uh, folks who are working uh, a handful of hours a week and comparable kinds of positions. I used the, the uh, the comparison to, uh, you know, people who uh, sell concessions at a movie theater. Um, I, I don't have the answer to, to that. And just lastly, Senator Mr. Champion, uh, your testifier or the testifier stated that uh, baseball players, uh, uh, you know, those who, those that we're talking about, their pay ranges from eight hundred dollars to ten thousand dollars. So if you're on the low end of that $800, I'm not sure how many games they play, I'm not sure how long that they have to be there, all I know is that baseball games can be rather lengthy. That's what I do know. So I could see someone who's making $800 a month for the team being on the lower end of the totem pole and being subjected to, or subject to, the minimum wage even as what's being considered by uh, St. Paul. So with that being said, uh, perhaps we can, you know, allow others to uh, uh, speak. But I don't quite see uh, the the senator's logic when we think in terms of some, in terms of someone making eight hundred dollars a month. All right, members, we have several folks on the list. Uh, senator Little is next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my first question is: uh, under current law and current uh, salaries, how many of your players are making less than minimum wage? Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, that's a great question that I don't have uh, the answer for at this point in time. Uh, it's something that we can get for you. At this point in time, we actually have not signed our roster. Um, we're just in the process of putting together our roster. Uh, so I would have to defer to a later date to be able to provide you with that information. Senator Little. Uh, so my question could apply to last year as well, if you have the data from last year on your salaries, and um, I'm sure you have a rough estimation of, I mean, you, you got to know the average time each game um, in practice. Um, uh, I mean, could you use last year's numbers to determine how many players made less than minimum wage? Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Senator, I, would, I, would, I do not have the numbers in front of me. If I were to 
um, estimate, I would estimate uh, somewhere in the range of boy, um, six to eight of our players, probably closer to six. Okay. Send it a little. Uh, <clears throat> so I play a lot of basketball, and in basketball, you, you basically get injured every time you play. Um, how, in, in baseball, what is, um, what's kind of the average injury rate for your players? Mr. Scherr. Uh, Senator, uh, injury rate. Uh, again, data that I don't have at my fingertips. Okay. Certainly would have, be able to, to research that and let you know how many injuries we receive on average a year. Okay. Yeah, well, and, 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 I, and I guess relative to, uh, it, it, we, we aren't asking for an exemption to work comp. Um, certainly, we, we, do, uh, we do provide work comp coverage for all of our employees, including players. Senator Little. I'm almost done. I, must be some I, rough basketball games you can uh, get hurt every time Well, you it's play. a manner, you know, when you don't have the skill, you have to play. Senator Isaac, Senator. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Senator Little. Uh, so, you know, oftentimes, oftentimes athletes are, I can wait. Uh, oftentimes, athletes are making the consideration whether to continue playing, um, you know, based on uh, the money versus whether it's good for their physical or, or mental health. And so that's why I asked that question in terms of uh, how much they're making and what is the likelihood they get injured. Um, uh, so then my last question is, um, um, when, a, when you're approaching a player or maybe a player is approaching your team, um, is there a negotiation uh, for salary or is it just these set rates? Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator. There is a limited negotiation uh, based on the fact that we do operate under a salary cap. Um, so there is very limited room to move, but certainly a player could make uh, a couple hundred dollars or more, a couple hundred dollars more per month with another team than they do with us. And certainly those players are trying to find the best opportunity. <clears throat> okay, and then. Senator Little. This is my last comment. I, I played eighth grade B team baseball. Um, I'm available, uh, <laughs> so let, let us know. But thank you for coming in, and, and thank you for answering those questions. And thank Mr. You. Mr. Chairman, let me Senator Cohen. be clear to Senator Little. I uh, appreciate his availability, and that would be on a seasonal basis because the session ends the end of May, so you'd be right in time for the Saints season. Is that what you're... <laughs> Senator Goggin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'm just curious... Do you currently track players' hours? Because earlier in your testimony, you talked about uh, <clears throat> that you're open to the potential of minimum wage and overtime laws. So I'm curious about the overtime laws. Uh, do you track all your players' times? And if you do, what times are considered to be tra traceable, whether it be practice times, game times, travel time, et cetera? Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Um, we. We certainly have access to track that. I don't have that data at my fingertips. Um, but we would consider uh, when those, certainly those players are considered at work with the Saints uh, when they're in the ballpark um, playing training for, the, for Saints baseball. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I also played a lot of sports in my skinnier days, but uh, we weren't hurt that often. Um, maybe a little tougher league. Um, um, but what, what I had a question about was, you know, you talked about six or eight employees maybe being on that lower end of the pay scale, whatever it is, doesn't really matter to me. Yeah. Um, how many total players do you have on your roster that would qualify under this? And then how many total employees would you have that would be non-players? Just for curiosity. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Uh, at any given point in time, uh, our roster uh, is composed of 24 players. Um, we are employing uh, non-player staff. Uh, we are employing uh, full-time in the range of uh, 25 to 30 
employees. Uh, Full-time equivalents are much larger than that. I don't have that number in front of me, but uh, certainly with, with uh, seasonal part-time, uh, the number is well in the hundreds. So, every, Senator Drahan. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, at the end of the year, you mail out a lot of tax forms for two, three hundred people easy, right? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I think this question was asked, but I'm not sure the answer came out, and maybe I missed it. Um, I'm assuming your players, once they're signed and the spring training starts, they're pretty much working full time on baseball through the season. So, 40 hours plus, probably, as a part of the game, right? Okay, so um, so Mr. Uh, just for the record, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Oh, Senator Isaac Gordon nods. Do we? That's fair. Uh, <clears throat> I can't help but wonder um, if this is a bill designed to help you na navigate what St. Paul does when they're thinking about raising the minimum wage. I'll be more candid that I'm pretty sure that is being considered. And uh, my problem is, I think that logically you're bringing something that makes sense, but it isn't our place to tell St. Paul how to manage their business. I've been pretty clear about local control from the very beginning, and I'll continue to be local, local control here, that even if it does make sense, uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not interested in passing a bill that would circumnavigate what St. Paul does in its labor laws. And so uh, whether you want to say it's a preemption bill or not, that's kind of how it appears to me at this point. That doesn't mean I wouldn't even ask St. Paul to consider it, right? But you're talking about eight players, and if you're doing full time, it's about $2,400 a month versus $800 a month. Freight players, I mean, I'm not pretending to understand the baseball business as I have no business being anywhere in the other field, unlike Senator Little. I will tell you that uh, <clears throat> I have a little bit of a hard time if I'm going to be consistent on my votes when it comes to wages and labor, just come back and say, we're going to come up here and exempt a team or a business in St. Paul from this responsibility. And so uh, I struggle um, in understanding the, the timing of it, because how long has the Saints been here? Mr. Chair? Uh, sure. This will be our 26th season. Right, and so I heard this bill was first introduced last session. Is that right, or is there other times I'm not aware of? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Chairman, can uh, I, Mr. Cohn, or Senator Cohn? Mr. Chairman, if I can address that. The bill was introduced toward the end of last year's session. I will tell you that uh, the person who approached me was uh, Mr. Tom Whaley, who's the president of the team. Mm -hmm. And I asked him very explicitly that question, Senator Isaacson, and he was surprised. And I, and I know Mr. Whaley uh, quite well, and he was very surprised he had he said, I've never thought about that. <coughs> Not that he hadn't heard about it, but he said, mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that in the context of the Saints at all. Uh, he was thinking in the context of what's happened with minor, minor league baseball around the country. Um, and I explicitly asked him. He explicitly denied it. Uh, and again, I know him well enough to know that he was not being disingenuous with me. Senator Isaac. I would never go so far as to impugn the character of Senator Cohen as a pillar in our community here in the Senate. I would say, however, let's just assume for a second, I have a question for counsel, the best of intentions of what we're trying to accomplish here. We're just trying to make sure a baseball team sticks around and does a good job, right? Could you tell me what type of amendments might this bill serve as a vehicle to when it comes to exemption and labor laws? Can you give me an example of range of possibilities you could uh, offer amendments on this bill? Well, uh, Senator Isaacs, I'm not sure if that's a, a well, fair Well, tell question. me what section of code does it deal with then? Council. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, and Senator Isaacson, this is Chapter 177, which is labor law, and two sections that are very close are the minimum wage statute mm -hmm. and the overtime statute. So d this would be At a section that you could amend. Right. Senator Isaacson. So, so I think that I have some concerns, not that I would ever assume the lower nature of anybody, but I'm a little concerned about what this might be down the road. And uh, uh, I'm uncomfortable with the bill that moves forward that could be a vehicle for something else that isn't nearly as magnanimous and awesome as this is because I don't want to do the Saints any harm. So I just want to be clear that I'm opposed to this. I think it needs to be done at the city level, and I want to avoid even the appearance of impropriety on this. Is It's not our job to be on the top Senator of that. Cohen. So, Mr. Chairman, a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Isaacson, relative to your comment about impugning my integrity, what I inferred from your question was not relative to myself but questioning whether or not the Saints were looking for, for an end run um, to mix sports metaphors. Um, and that's why I suggested in talking to Mr. Whaley, uh, he was totally caught off guard when I asked the question. So I don't think in any way he was being disingenuous. Second, relative to your question about is this going to be a vehicle for something, it, my intent was to introduce a fairly simple, straightforward bill. If I find this is going to be a vehicle for something else, I would immediately ask for progress of the bill. And all the years I've been here, um, I have never seen an author 
denied progress of his or her bill on the floor of the Senate, ever. I have Senator Utke and then Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, being down the list of ways, a number of my questions have already been answered. But I've got one thing that, you know, in professional sports, usually we hear that, uh, you know, the players are paying tax in the states they play, so you're considered employed there. Does that affect you with this level of baseball, and would that start to break up the fact that they play in Minnesota today and North Dakota tomorrow or next week and all those type of things? Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator. I, I, I'm not aware, to, to my knowledge, they, our players are paying taxes only in Minnesota. Senator Ucky, any other questions? Oh, that, that answered it, because I know that, you know, if we take the Twins or our, uh, the Vikings or those, those type of players are taxed where they play the game, but yes. it's not that case where, at your level. I so thank you. So. Thank you. Interesting. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and perhaps that Senator uh, Cohen could also help with this question. So it's my understanding that we've been talking a lot about and referring to seasonal employees in carnivals and ski facilities. But Senator Cohen, isn't it true that they are only exempt from overtime and not minimum wage? So can you clarify your earlier statements, whether I'm right or wrong? Because it's my understanding, if that's true, that you are asking for uh, these workers to be exempt from minimum wage and overtime requirements. So can you clarify that for me, Senator Cohen? Senator Cohen? Mr. Chairman, I would defer to counsel on that question. Counsel? Mr. Chair, members and, and uh, Senator Cohen, Senator Champion, you are correct that the, um, in Clause 13 that's on line 2.16 about the seasonal employees, that that is, I believe, it's just the overtime requirement. So the... Uh, minor league baseball players couldn't fit, it, fit into this clause because the exemption would be for minimum wage as well. But, so, Senator Champion. So, Mr. Chair, Senator Cohen, so earlier when you were articulating, you know, where they could fit or could not fit and the differences with um, what was happening on the ski slopes, one of the differences clearly is that you're asking for the Saints to be exempt from both minimum wage, which is why we've been talking a lot about St. Paul, and overtime. And so does that line up with what your request is? And then I have one last question, Mr. Chair. Senator well, Cohn. Mr. Chairman, Senator Champion, Mr. Chair has indicated what the concern and the problem is. Uh, and we both come from cities that have been dealing with the issue of minimum wage. I don't have, my guess is that if you did the arithmetic for the ballplayers, um, and, and I've not had the chance to do it with, with Mr. Sher, but I'm assuming if you did the arithmetic for the ballplayers, I don't know what time they're required to come to a ballpark on the day of a game, say 6 p.m. or something. Mr. Sher, would that be? Uh, no, they would arrive, they would ar thank you. They, they would arrive earlier, uh, likely between 2 and 3 p.m. So if they arrive 2 to 3 p.m. and they're playing a ball game until roughly, what, 10 p.m.? Yes. And how many games a week during the course of the season? Uh, 100 games for the season separated over four months. Uh, so some weeks it would be seven, some weeks it might be five. So, Mr. Chairman, I would guess if you did the arithmetic, you'd be pretty close to that $15 an hour, even at the lower end, um, depending on the day of the week and so on. Uh, but, Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman, if I might respond to Senator Champion, though, because I want to turn uh, um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Champion has, has jumped to the defense of my city. I'm very curious, and, and maybe it's something that we could relate to this bill, as to what's happened with Target Center, U.S. Bank Stadium, um, Target Field relative to vendors, you know, the, the people who sell hot dogs at the stadium, if they're covered by the $15 an hour in Minneapolis. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So two ways I'll answer that question. And perhaps my answer can be helped by 
the testifier. So just so I'm clear, when a player comes in to work out and do training and practice, are they paid? Mr. Shear. Mr. Shear. Mr. Chairman, Senator, uh, they are paid a monthly salary. So, Senator Champion. It is required that they come in and work out and they do everything that a player is supposed to do. And so that's added as a part of workout training plus the daily gr grind of playing those 100 games. Is that right? Mr. Scher. Uh Yes, Senator. So Senator when you, Champion. So when you aggregate those numbers, it far exceeds the overtime notion. So they are obviously spending more time in, in practice as well as games that exceeds the, 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 the overtime requirement. But since you asked good questions about Target Center and, and the others around vendors, I'm more than sure that they would be subject, or at least I would think they would be subject to, but I, I believe that they're not the focus of our discussion today. I'm sorry for somebody was trying Center to tell me something, but I'm sure that he will articulate it well as, as well. But we're not talking about Target Center and the others, and if they came over and asked such a question to, to get around the minimum wage notion, I believe that I would be asking the same questions because the city of Minneapolis has articulated what they would, would think people who are in the city of Minneapolis should do. Well, so with that being said, training, plus games would take these individuals well into what would, be, what, what would constitute overtime. And what is before us today seeks to exempt them from overtime and minimum wage, which is what the others are exempted, uh, wh where the other carnival and seasonal folks are only exempted from overtime and not the minimum wage. So I just wanted to make sure that we were clear about that. Senator Isaacson, did you have anything to add to that? Just to point out that if the seasonal workers, to my understanding, or the vendors are being regulated by Minneapolis law, it's because it's Minneapolis, and that's their rule. And I think that's the same thing here. I'm not even saying, I don't think what you're saying is unreasonable. I get why you're asking this. Makes sense. I, I can understand you're trying to run a business model that's unique, but I think that your relationship and the governance you need to look at here isn't from us. It's from the city of St. Paul because that's where you were based and located, recruited by, and that's who you've been working with. Um, I'm uncomfortable with the precedent, and I'm absolutely uncomfortable with this being a vehicle, although I'm assured by Senator Cohen that he said he pulled the bill if that was what happened. But I think this is a St. Paul issue, not a Minnesota state issue, so I don't think the bill deserves to be here. That's my point. Senator Cohen. Mr. Chairman, Senator Isaacson, just relative to that, then you've got significant sections of statute that uh, we should amend to make sure that they're only relevant to the particular city, such as the overtime section, as pointed out by Senator Champion. All right, members, we're having a good, healthy discussion. Any other discussion on Senate file 1901? Senator Simonson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had one question that uh, I've been wrestling around in my head since we started this discussion and I've listened to the debate and it's been interesting. Um, but either you, Senator Cohen, or the testifier, do you have a sense uh, with the new stadium that the Saints is playing in now, how much public money was invested in that project? Senator Cohen or Mr. Chair? Um, Senator Cohen? Mr. Chairman, Senator Simonson, I, I, I know that the, uh, the bonding authorization was $25 million, I believe. And there was St. Paul money as well. I'm not sure how much St. Paul money there, was, there actually was. I believe that. Mr. Chair? I believe that was $17 million. Senator Mr. Simonson? Mr. Chair and Senator Cohen, thank you. And uh, there's been some discussion about uh, the St. Paul City Council and perhaps their intentions going forward with a minimum wage ordinance uh, or not. Uh, but my, my direct question is, have they weighed in on this particular issue? Have, has anybody approached the St. Paul City Council? Has this come with uh, either a recommendation or uh, uh, 
anything from the council. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator, Cohn. Senator Simonson, um, obviously uh, St. Paul has a new mayor as of roughly January 1st, not a new city council. I can tell you since the bill's been introduced, nobody from the city has said anything to me, whether it be um, the prior administration, Mayor Coleman's administration, or members of the city council. Mr. Chair, to, uh, just a last comment. I, I would say this, members, that ha having participated in the, in the great debate when we last uh, raised the minimum wage statewide and uh, it was painful. Uh, that was that was a long debate and a lot of negotiations, uh, a lot of discussions. Uh, I was on the other side of the street then, but um, I, I think we need to be careful when we when we make exemptions to to a very fresh mi uh, statewide minimum wage bill. And regardless of what the impact is going to be in in the city of St. Paul going forward, I, I do think that we need to be careful with this and. Uh, and we also need to be aware of, of the size of the public uh, investment uh, of dollars into the stadium. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that uh, this bill doesn't have merit, and I'm not suggesting that uh, what you're talking about doesn't have some merit as well, but I think, I think it deserves uh, uh, more debate and perhaps more attention, uh, and, and I think we should very, be very cautious about that. Senator Goggin. Yeah, along with this discussion, I'd like to uh, move the A3, A2 amendment, if I could. Okay. What's the number on it? Okay. Members, uh, we have an A2 amendment that's being passed out. Please make sure they get one, too. Senator Goggin, as the A2 amendment is being distributed, I think uh, all the members have a copy now. Uh, can you please uh, uh, explain your amendment, please? Oh. Senator Goggin, to the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as this discussion is about seasonal work, uh, one area of our, our state that we're having a tremendous amount of problem with seasonal work and getting seasonal employees there. Um, what this one does is it exempts uh, uh, seasonal workers from the overtime, uh, uh, give them the overtime exemption over 48 hours. And uh, basically this uh, brings, uh, brings us competitive with other states. We have uh, farmers that are going out of business. We had a farmer this last uh, spring that lost their contract with a very large vendor. Uh, to, a, to a company, a farmer from another farm from out of state. And uh, we, need to, we need to do all we can to levelize the playing field and to make sure that these uh, uh, farmers and the, and the workers are able to earn a good living. And uh, this is for workers, uh, uh, farmers that have perish perishable fruits, vegetables, uh, and other horticultural and nursery uh, stock. And um, you know the, these workers uh, right now are, are being held at 48 hours. They're having a hard time uh, with being able to stay here at 48 hours a week, and uh, they're looking at going to other states that do not have that uh, uh, rule in place for the 40 anything over 48 hours. Senator Cohn. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, we've had this debate relative to this bill, and Senator Isaacson asked about what might happen on the floor. And so, Senator Goggins, Mr. Chairman, Senator Goggins, uh, I can appreciate what you might be attempting to do. I'm not conversant with that. I don't serve on this committee. Um, I simply wanted to present a simple bill relative to the St. Paul Saints. I'm, I'm hesitant to let the bill uh, get larger and any number of regards, including issues raised by Senator Isaacson. So with all due respect, would, would hope that this amendment would, would not be part of the bill, would make it difficult for me to continue with the bill. Um, and, and let me just add, um, Mr. Chairman, it, it, and I apologize, this is digressing from Senator Goggins' amendment, I apologize for that, but I want to just clarify a couple of things. The, the Saints approached me because of, of concerns that, that have happened in California, uh, which is certainly viewed as a, very much of a pro-labor state, 
and the state of Ohio relative to independent uh, baseball teams. Second, uh, relative to the St. Paul uh, prospective wage ordinance, if St. Paul passes an ordinance, the Saints are still under the jurisdiction of the ordinance. They'd have to then worry about how they fit in with any other category. And that's why, Mr. Chairman and Senator Goggins, getting back to your amendment, my hope was to keep this bill as a fairly simple bill uh, that would deal with state law, not St. Paul City Ordinance, um, and, and not get into other aspects of, of labor law. Um, plus, um, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, I've been here for a while. I don't think I've ever gotten into an extensive ag debate on the floor because that's just a little bit beyond me. And now, Senator Goggins, you would force me to do that, and, and I don't know how I would do it. So, Senator Isaacson. Senator Cohen, would you withdraw the bill? Senator Cohen. Um, Mr. Chairman, Sir Isaacson, mm. uh, it, it would be difficult for me to continue with the bill because I just, uh, the, you know, my kidding aside about my background with ag or not, I said I'm looking to do a, a fairly simple bill, number one, number two. This gets into something far no, beyond I'm, my capability. No, I'm asking you if you'll Senator withdraw. Senator Isaacson. I'm asking if you'll withdraw the bill right now. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Sir Isaacson, no. Okay, I'd like to move to table the bill, and I want a roll call. What? Okay, uh, so we have the, I know the, you can't, there's no discussion on tabling a bill, but we do have the A2 amendment in front of us. Do I have so to? Council, can Mr. you please Chair, provide some guidance? I was going to ask, do I have to wait till the amendment's done, then I move to table? Oh, I apologize. I can hold off. My bad. You're right, I think. Okay. Members, any other discussion on the A2 amendment? Senator Little. Um, I guess I think my remarks are going to be a little more crass, and, and, and I want to talk directly to Mr. Scherer. Um, you know, some people choose to play baseball, um, and some people choose to play politics, and that's what's happening right here. Uh, this amendment being added onto this bill would, would functionally uh, defeat what you're trying to accomplish. It will get nowhere. Uh, it'll get vetoed, um, but this bill becomes dead in the water, and I think mm -hmm. you should know that. Uh, that, that members that vote to put this amendment on are trying to defeat what you're trying to do. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Goggin, and, and just to be clear, I'm not, we do not know if there's support on this committee for the underlying bill or not. The, te the conversation I'm hearing is I would, I'm not sure that the bill would, would pass this committee, Senator Little. So I think that's a little bit of an unfair statement uh, to jump to that conclusion. But uh, Senator Goggin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to thank you for saying that because now I don't have to. Um, this has nothing to do with playing politics. This has everything to do with the state of agriculture in our state and the ability of our farmers in this state to be able to uh, do as the baseball team is trying to do with uh, be competitive across the nation. And to say that this is politics, I, I'm very... Uh, that's disheartening to hear from a colleague of mine. And I think our farmers across the state and our baseball players across the, the minor leagues would, would be upset with that as well. This has nothing to do with politics. This has everything to do with making sure we have a strong, robust agricultural community in this state and that we have workers that can come in this state and come here and workers within the state that can earn a good living. There's nothing wrong with earning a good living, last I heard. So anybody who sits here and says that this is political, other than the fact that it's political in the sense that I want to see everybody succeed in this state, all farmers, all baseball players, all workers. I'm a union member for crying out loud. And to hear that is very, very disheartening to hear from my colleagues. Thank you. Senator Isaacson. Mr. Chair, uh, this is a bill about a baseball team. That's what this is supposed to be about. To think or pretend like this isn't seen outside of this room as being a partisan move to add agriculture workers to it is at best disingenuous and shocking that anybody would try to defend that as not being a political move to me. I don't mean to within disrespect to you, Senator Gargas. I have the world of respect to you, but I'm telling you, at least in the appearance, there's no other way. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure I called this happening before it did. I asked specifically what could be added on this. That's completely a political play. And so I'm not trying to impugn your 
either. I'm just saying that <clears throat> clearly that's what it appears like. And, and keep it focused. If you want to be like that, bring it to my ag committee and let's talk about it. Mr. Members, <laughs> let's just be clear that the bill in front of us is exempting an organization from wages and overtime. The bill that, or the amendment that Senator Goggin has in front of us does something very similar. This is about wages and overtime. Um, so let's let's keep it Mr. focused on the A2 amendment. Senator Cohn. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I don't want to get into a discussion of what's political, what's not political. Um, I will only suggest it's, it's unique. Uh, where an author presents a bill, a relatively simple bill, to try to amend it in a significantly different way than what that author presented. Um, I was kidding about you know, not presenting an ag bill, but serious about uh, that this goes far beyond the scope of the bill I'm attempting to present. Senator Isaacson asked me if I would table the bill. The answer is no. I'd like to see what happens with the amendment, but it becomes difficult for me to carry this bill to the floor when it, it, it's dealing with a subject area then that I'm certainly, I certainly don't have the expertise to do, not, don't have the familiarity with, and so uh, that becomes uh, tough for me as an author to, uh, to do that. Senator Goggin. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll make it brief. Uh, at the beginning of this discussion, we were talking about seasonal employees, correct? So why are we saying that one group of seasonal employees is different than another set of seasonal employees? This is all about seasonal employees in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Goggin, can, can you correct me if I'm wrong, is that you are carrying the minimum wage uh, uh, bill that exempts ag workers, is that right? Um, Senator Goggin. That is correct, yes, Mr. Chair. And so Senator with that, Champion. Mr. Chair, that, that, uh, then I think it would be much more appropriate for us to uh, hear that bill at another time dealing with the issues that you've articulated in this amendment. And, and I think that's where you separate and bifurcate this issue that is before the committee to uh, deal with uh, and, and for us to deal with ag workers and, and all the important uh, issues that they have to deal with agriculturally. So, so I would think that these two things should be bifurcated and therefore you remove the political aspect of things uh, being uh, uh, shaded in any real sense. So S S Senator Goggin, would you consider that? And members, before we go to Senator Goggin, uh, this committee did pass uh, this language or something very similar to it last year. We had a robust discussion in this committee. Senator Goggin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I will not. This is about seasonal employment. You can call it politics all you want. You can call it whatever you want to call it. The bottom line is this is about seasonal employment in the state of Minnesota. Senator Little. Thank you, Chair. I think Senator Champion has uh, done the bulk of the work on, on what I wanted to say, which is, um, you know, if we were to withdraw this amendment and, and consider it separately uh, in a separate hearing, uh, I know, Mr. Chair, you'd have the authority to, to call that. Um, I'd view that as the proper way to do things, and I'd be, I'd be happy to apologize to Senator Goggin. And members, uh, a reminder, we had a full committee hearing on this language already last session. Any other discussion? Okay, we have the A2. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion is adopted. All right, now members, we have the, let's see, Senate file 1901 as amended in front of us. Mr. Senator I. Mr. Chairman. Senator Cohen. Mr. Chairman, with, with, with apologies, and I just indicated this, Mr. Chair, that this goes far beyond the scope of what I had intended. And I'd ask that the bill be withdrawn from the committee agenda. Okay. Um, so the, do we, uh, Senate Council, do we vote on a bill being withdrawn, or can the author just withdraw it? It's Mr. Chair, I, I believe that uh, Senator Cohen can no, you have to vote on that. Well, Mr. Senator Chairman, Cohen. it's been my experience as a matter of courtesy to an author. Um, the bill would remain within this committee. If it's withdrawn, it's not uh, tabled, it's not uh, 
uh, defeated, but it's been my experience that uh, we're something that's happened within a committee that the courtesy has been extended to, to the author to allow the author to withdraw the bill. Um, the amendment's been added to the bill, so that would be the shape in which the bill resides in the committee. Uh, there could be a vote. Uh, somebody would have to move something. I can't do that. I'm not a member of the committee. But again, it's my experience that that's been a matter of courtesy extended authors. Okay, so as a courtesy to the author, Senator Champion will move um, for Senate file uh, 1901 as amended to be withdrawn. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Chairman, uh, members, thank you very much for the thank uh, you. discussion. Thank okay, you. and thank members, uh, we did our housekeeping and talked about our next committee meeting uh, and what the agenda will be a little bit earlier. So our next committee meeting is on Wednesday. Uh, with that, that completes our agenda, and we are adjourned.